shitty as that. Yeah, I'm just as good as a pilot. And then, then, then you, you can't talk to the pilot. All righty, good morning <laughs> for morning minutes with myself. That, that was a weak start. Let's do that again. <laughs> morning minutes with myself, Michael Burjo, Mark Novak, and our special developer guest, David Allen, here to talk about this morning the basics, the one, two, three, if you want to get into the development business from... We're going to take you from the journey of you see a property on realestate.com, real commercial, or it's been introduced. What are the basic first couple steps you should be doing just to see if it is a development site and it's worthwhile? Gents, good morning. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Mr. Burjo. All righty. Let us, so David, do you want to just sort of maybe just start at the back about who you are? I know you've been on the, on the show a couple of times, but for anyone just tuning in, just to sort of qualify yourself with what you've done in the past with developments and what you do. Uh, sure. Um, over the last uh, 20 years on the Northern beaches, we've uh, uh, put together a number of apartment projects and uh, a number of semi-detached um house developments where we look to split uh, an existing house site and uh, deliver two new homes on it. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today with you. Beautiful. Because I think a lot of people, it's almost like training, you know, those like training or financial help people where they say or do, do all this stuff and they've never actually done it themselves. So it's let people know out there watching that you've done it, you're on you're on the front lines, the grounds, you're dealing with councils, you're qualifying sites um, all the time. So let's, do you wanna, I'll bring up a, a sheet that we've done, but do you wanna talk us through it? And I'll bring it up in a sec. Sure. Um, so the example that um, we're gonna go through today is a, is a real live property, but we'll just uh, keep the information nice and simple. Yep. And, uh, what the situation was, was there's a property that uh, was available for purchase or was introduced to us to, to consider. And so the first thing that um, we do is have, have a look at the property itself. Um, <clears throat> Should we go inside? You go there inside? we go. Yep. yep, there we go. So uh, up on the screen. So the first thing that we, we like to do is- did, uh, did you do that yourself, Dave? No, I did it. I was gonna say you've really come leaps and bounds. Yes, yes. First my... the headphone, first the headphones. Now this. Yes, technical drawing skills, and so the first thing that we um, would often do is uh, there's a a public domain site called Six Maps, uh, and we can put the the link to that uh, at the end of the program on that. And what that will do is allow you to map the area and the frontage of the of the site. Which, and why is that did, important? Because if we were lo looking at this site to, to potentially put two homes on it, um, we need to understand uh, its overall area and its frontage. Because uh, the next the next uh, step that we need to do is then to look on uh, the the planning constraints of the property and another great public domain website which is New South Wales planning portal which we'll also put a link up for you at the end of the show to have a look at and it, provide, and it provides some information there that uh, it's an R2 zoned low residential and there's a minimum lot size of 700 square meters now <clears throat> in theory uh, we need 1400 square meters yet this property is 1,340 square meters. So it's technically not able to be split in two. Um, however, um, if you fast forward 20 years of um, development experience, council will often consider the ability to uh, split uh, a block if it's within five to 10% of uh, the, the notional range. So this would so form- so just there, I'll interrupt because that's a huge thing um, and a lot of people don't understand that and this could mean some really good buying for people out there because a lot of people, a lot of developers or people looking at subdivide, they will instantly just look at minimum lot 700, needs to be 1400, if it's 1398, no, no good, next property, which means there could be some good opportunity to buy some properties that people aren't thinking that way because they may not have the in-depth knowledge to do it. Do you and think some, is it a bit higher risk or is it pretty strong the precedent? 
but some properties guys are for like 400 400 some are 600 600 some are 700 700 so it does change on, on depending on what area you're in yeah yeah right. and that's why you've got to jump on that planning link that i just popped in so first step you see a property then you go to either uh six maps get your lengths and your widths and your area size so that means when you go to the planning portal and it tells you what zoning and the size, you know if it qualifies straight away. What's, what's next, Dave? So um, we're at the stage now uh, saying that there is a chance that council uh, would consider the subdivision of that site. So then we start looking at, well, what are the alternative uses that we can use that site for? And the alternative outcomes um, given that we think that there's an opportunity to split the block and so speaking with various builders planners uh, real estate agents such as yourselves what is the target market looking for and uh, we've put a table in below there Michael if you want to put that up and um, what we determined is that the the market there would um, ultimately like uh, a new two new homes, uh, four bedroom, uh, two and a half bathroom, second living room, undercover garage for a couple of cars. And the most efficient way to deliver that um, is something like a GJ Gardener or one of the other project home uh, people deliver an awesome quality home uh, for something in that sort of one point $4 million range, $1.5 million range, including landscaping for two homes. And looking at several projects that, or several homes in that area, uh, that seems to be the most efficient way to deliver an, an outcome there. But just so take that, it back a step. So your R2 subdivision. So within that, because R2 is quite common, Northern Beaches, so that yep. applies to a lot of properties. But within there, you've got not just the style of properties, let's say for example, to confuse people, but you may get a mixed use uh, development, like a B2, a B4 or an R3. And then you're actually deciding between, because um, the R2 is actually quite simple because your options are quite minimal. Obviously you've got a lot of designs within, but it's really subdivision. But with R3, you've got to decide you could do a subdivision or you may do uh, a medium density unit block, you may do a boarding house, you may do a, a more re a showroom development. So you've actually got that step on different zonings as well, just to fill in, fill in the gap for people. And then yeah, when you've yeah. decided what style of product, then you go within the style of the style, which is what Correct. we're going through now. Yes, um, thank you. And so the point I was trying to make and and didn't do it as well as you made it, Michael, was start with the outcome and work backwards. And, you know, the ultimate outcome is two homes. What is the most efficient way to deliver those two homes, but yet provide the quality and the features that the market wants? Because agents like you can only get the best price if you give the give the customers or the purchasers what they need. Yes. And the, the most efficient way around the block to, to achieve that, we thought, was a, um, a good quality project home. Uh, on the budgets that we spoke about. So then we work back another level of, you need to get a subdivision for the land in order to put uh, the two homes on it. And if you were going to put the development application in for the subdivision, you put it in together with the homes. So taking a step back to looking at point B, what what is the value of the uh, of the outcome if you just had the development approval Mm. and didn't go and develop the homes because we want to look at all stages there and what the value, the cost and the time and the risk is for each step. And funding so hard as well on top of to do to build houses or to do any of this. So you've got to consider that in this move. Because well, hey. I yeah. think a lot of people think... Well, David, you know, because you're like a multi-gazillionaire, but most people have to. <laughs> yes, but I I think a big point to let people know, David, is um, you don't have to be the builder who's going to do it to do the DA. I think a lot of people feel, well, I'm not a developer. I, I can't build it. I won't build it. So what's the point? Um, but a part of this is to stress you can get significant upshot by doing the DA. And you don't have to be a builder of 30 years to do that, do you, David? That like 
no. you, your mum and dad can do this to hopefully achieve a higher price on the sale property and not have any intention of picking up a shovel or paying a builder. Well, you don't have to activate the DA even to create the subdivision. No, correct. So I think that the, the real key point on this property is you can sell it as it is. Let's just run through the alternatives. If you can get one to 1.3 for it now, if it was your property or to, to buy it, uh, you don't have to do anything other than get Novak six week campaign and auction. Yep. But if you were to go and get the DA and it's at a cost of about $75,000, uh, takes six to 12 months and we need to test with council to get those that two lot subdivision. And given that it's within that five to 10% range, there's a good chance of success. But if we look at the relative uplift in value from 1.1 1 to 1.3 to 2 to 2.4 for an investment of $75,000 and you don't need to go and build the, the homes as, as uh, Mark was saying, that to me where that's to me the sweet spot of where the, the money is to be captured. Whether somebody wants to go and build the homes or not, that's a, diff that's a different story. Yeah. And, and be before we wrap it up, I just got to, I wanna, also wanted to ask Dave, Dave, cause it's been interesting. I've seen 18 government road in Narawina. Um, these guys only had a thousand and fifty meters squared and the council required 1200 meter squared plus access handles, maybe 1300. Um, but they, their adjoining properties had already been chopped. So council took a pretty big consideration even beyond the 10, 5, 10% rule. Interesting. Um, there are a number of, and this, this is really a question for a planner, but there's a number of um, aspects in, in planning that allow if there is precedents that have occurred in the local precinct where uh, council have approved subdivisions where there may not have been uh, the required amount of area yeah. uh, that subsequent applications can follow in, in terms of precedent. So I'm not aware of the details of that, but it, it's suggesting that that may be the case. Yeah, and that's what we uh, you said at the beginning. So just a big takeaway and the, the point of today's show, and thanks for coming on, David, is to give people out there the basic concept of a starting point and where an end point can be. I think a lot of people love the idea of doing a DA and doing a development, but they don't really know where a start stop. It's like someone doing a home renovation and they start at the bathroom, then they end up doing everything and they, they don't know the clear lines when to stop. So I hope today's show has really given people the, the guidance of you see a property, I'll put the link for the two websites there, your six maps, your New South Wales planning portal to see if it's got legs. And a big thing that we're, um, you said today, David, is don't just, if it says minimum 700 and you got a 13, 1,390 square meter block, don't just rule it out straight away as I think a, a thing would be, a good thing would to, to do is see if there is precedent in the area because technically if it says minimum 700 and you're under then some I am assu I'm assuming a lot of some councils would be pretty good at yep close enough we're happy to allow it and some may have a pretty hard opinion of no it doesn't qualify so what Mark said with one in especially northern beaches there are a couple with precedent so that would probably be a, bit, a big step as well um and then they all, they all have a curl to them don't they there's never like the shoe in a like shoe in perfect development there's always something curly on them hmm. and that's where it's pretty important to get some good advice from a town planner someone like david to consult like what you said, realistically, if you're spending 75 grand on a DA and get a potential uplift of, in our example here, of a million dollars, investing in five or 10 grand just for that second opinion of a consultant or for the consultant to run the process. Like you could either do two options, either get them to review it. Um, what else, anything else we need to add on to this, David, that you really want to get across? Uh, sure, um, look, and. For, the, for somebody like an existing owner, 
um, the ability to uh, create a new home because uh, it is their principal place of residence might be really beneficial to them. Uh, and whilst the margin in our example to uh, create additional profit from building the homes may, may not seem uh, as exponential as the, gaining the subdivision, uh, it might be a really good way to get a new home and s sell the other home off on a very tax effective basis. I was just about to say that. Isn't there a lot of benefit for people if they've owned a block for a long time and let's say they, they are not exempt from capital gains, there's a good way instead of selling your home, buying one that you want, if you build and then you re retain it and only sell one, there's, there's some good structures that you can do that, isn't it? Correct. And obviously people should speak to their own uh, accountant, but yes, there are very good structures that they can use to make it uh, tax exempt or tax effective and uh, gain a benefit that's not available to a developer uh, who would be uh, paying tax. Because yep. I've seen people sell the, they can sell the two blocks of land for more if they, if they proceed with the subdivision that they've got, but it's worth selling it as one block, which has already been approved, but not subdivided because they don't have any tax because they lived there. Something to talk with your accountant by, by, but it sounds pretty weird, doesn't it? When you say, oh, it's worth selling it for less because it's better for tax reasons. But we've, we've had that on a few deals, Mark, with the subdivisions where owners yeah. have themselves in a tricky position because they haven't structured it correctly at the beginning. And that's where you've really got to have that forward thinking. Like we've had a couple where they, it just got to not worth selling because they just didn't structure it right. So as much as it's important to have a consultant like David, have your town planner, have this, you also need to have your accountant and your structure correct. Otherwise, the half a million dollar upshot, bye-bye, going to the government. Like, yep. I think that's Tax. a big thing. And I think, um, David, isn't it like, having correct structures is a is probably a, I wouldn't, it's a, a bit, it's a silent, you don't hear it being spoken much, but behind closed doors, any developer is very conscious of how it's structured, not necessarily the GR of the site. It's like, let's make sure it's structured correctly. Yeah, I agree. It, all of those things need to be considered at the very start, because once you set your structure at the start of a project, you, you can't change it as you go through and your tax implications are set. Yeah, unbelievable. Hey, David, is it, you know how you're like a really successful developer? Is that, that is that a $20 million Monet behind you, Picasso, maybe? <laughs> no, it's not. It's actually one of Australia's uh, most uh, collected artists. And he's um, he's passed away now, Mr. Robert Juniper from Western Australia. And one of his best mates who's still alive is Mr. John Olson, who's uh, still alive and in his 80s uh, in New South Wales. What type, is it water paint? Is no, it oil. Oil, okay, nice. You guys, right. are, so, you guys are so cultured. <laughs> um, all right, so I think we've got to take, thank you so much for your time. Before we sign off, um, Michael, are you, are you doing news on Saturday? No, so to the audience, yeah, there, I'll be off for probably four weeks. I've got to have a double fusion spine surgery from a pre-existing neck injury. So I'll be going in for hopefully my sixth and last surgery, but I'll be out for, yeah, four weeks. So be kind on Mark. He I, he doesn't have the backbone of myself and the presentation. <laughs> Not backbone, that's the wrong wording. <laughs> he doesn't have the... Look, I am a bit nervous. I've yeah. got to admit, uh, you, you do, uh, if for anyone that doesn't know, Michael's flying the plane at Novak and... Um, the setup this morning we had stuff ups with, but the setup is complicated because there's there's literally we could probably count almost a hundred things you have to do before you go live, like it bit like in an aeroplane. So uh, you do an amazing job, buddy, and thank you. Thank you. So um, yeah, well, thanks, Danny. Thank you, Mick, Stephanie, or Anmar for joining Luke. And I, I look forward to when I'm back to do some more with David as well. I love our little development ones. I still want to do the myth the myths about developments, David, the common things people say, like, I've got 10 homes together. I want to do a big unit block. Like, I, just, I still want to do the myths. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll do that. And we'll also do financing. So just
even though this is a little puppy development, it's still reasonably complicated to finance if you're building houses. That, that's another session, Dave, we can do with everyone. Sure, be great. And I would like, and I think a lot of, and one of sort of, uh, there's, you know, the, and I think one we need to highlight the risks. Like I know Roger Street was a big one, 12 Roger Street, which you're aware, David. I think we also need to highlight where if you are going to, outsource a builder some steps you need to make sure everything's okay some structures you need to personally be have in place if something goes wrong because i think that was a uh, an unfortunate example of basically a third party blew up the site and the developer went in liquidation due to a third party and i i think as much as we talk about the good stuff i think we really need to highlight shit gone wrong well, That'll be a great thanks. session. Perfect. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. Michael, good luck at the surgery. David, we'll, we'll do another session solo, you and I, um, and we'll speak soon. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye.